so I'm going to talk to you about the work that I've done with um, at the QE Hospital in Birmingham um, and the University of Birmingham um, Virtual Reality Department. I know a lot of this conference has been about use of virtual reality and simulation for training and for education um, purposes and for use by um, medical and nursing staff. Actually, what I've done is develop systems for use by patients in hospitals. Um, so my background is I'm an ST6 trainee in anaesthetics and pain medicine. Um, I used to be a trainee in ICM, that's another story, but anyway, so I'm one of the few people who have escaped intensive care. Um, and I, between um, uh, training, so I took four and a half years out um, between ST5 and ST6 um, following um, having my first child, so I spent 11 years in the RAF before that. Um, and had the fabulous opportunity of still being in Birmingham. And I'm now supported, although an NHS trainee, I'm supported for research purposes by the Academic Department of Military Anesthesia and Critical Care. So I still have exposure to military patients and they also fund um, some of the work we're doing. So what I'm going to talk about, um, has anyone here ever used virtual reality computer games for patients in hospital? Has anyone got any experience of using it? Anyone? Anyone seen it used? Children, adults? read about it yep okay so I want you to, to imagine this is a few years back for anyone who recognizes one of the early oculus that you've been gifted a, um, a VR computer gaming system for use on your ward in your hospital and I want you to think about how you're going to use it we see this quite a lot particularly um, in people who are working with children particularly in areas where um, virtual reality or computer games have um, have some evidence so for example stroke rehab a lot of elderly care work and people are bringing systems in using them on patients and having really quite mixed results so can anyone think of what some of the benefits might be to using computer gaming systems for patients make them feel better yeah yep engagement with with therapy right yep Absolutely. So by, so by providing with them with a virtual environment, you're changing their perspective of where they are. That's right. What are the issues with introducing new systems into hospitals as a whole? Money. Yeah. Money. And that's what I think drives people to be using commercial off-the-shelf systems. We can go and buy a Nintendo Wii or an Xbox for, you know, couple of hundred pounds. And people are then bringing them in for patient use. And the limitations of that are... Exactly. So what does it actually do? Do we know what it actually does? We've talked about distracting people from their environments. Could they just watch the TV? Could we just paint a nice mural on the wall? Could we, you know, actually does it do what we want it to do? So I'm going to talk about some of the interactive systems that we've built for our patients in Birmingham. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the human centred design process that we use that drove the um, choice of patient population and the design of the systems that we um, came up with. And also because it's a mixed medical background, give you some graphs and talk about our, our clinical trials which we've run. So we've used two different frameworks for developing our systems. This is the human centred de uh, design process that's in um, ISO 9241, which is one of the fascinating uh, engineering documents you'll find. And this is basically a simplistic model of an um, iterative cycle where you um, specify what you want from a system, you produce prototype solutions, you then evaluate those against um, your user requirements, and you go round in that cycle where you actually nail down exactly what you want from the system. And what you want from the system is to establish what the goal is of that system. So what is it trying to do better than you're doing already? So for example, if you've got a system that's encouraging a patient to mobilise better, does your interactive system encourage, um, encourage the patient to walk faster? Does it encourage better balance? Does it encourage better posture? And how is it going to do that? You then break down that goal into the individual tasks. So how is it going to get the patient walking faster? Is it going to uh, motivate them and shout at them and encourage them? You know, what does your personal trainer do? Is it going to give them, is it going to give them those goals? Is it going to give them performance feedback? Once you've gone round that and you've established exactly what you mean, you, you then produce your mature solution and then you evaluate it against your user requirements. 
when you're doing this within a medical setting, it's important that you deliver the um, study evaluating whether it works or not within a framework. And the framework that you, we use is the Medical Research Council framework for evaluating a complex intervention. Any of these interventions are categorised as being complex because it's not a drug that you give to a patient that you can then measure whether their blood pressure's dropped. It is a device that's used by different patients in a complicated environment that's affected by their uh, physical environment, their, um, their political environment of the hospital, their social environment, how much support they get, how much engineering support there is on the unit, where you're going to store it. So there's so many different things to think about that it's really important that within your evaluation you look at all the different con potential contextual modifiers to see what's making the device work and more importantly what's stopping it working if you get negative results. So this is the framework that we use, you'll be able to see it on the printout. So we start off, as with all research, with a research question. We then look at the literature to see whether it's been done before and whether there is any sort of crossover with work that's been done previously to make sure that we're one not copying something that someone else has already done. And actually, we have to be pretty meticulous about looking at that research. A lot of work is being done that's not being published in certainly journals that we would come across. Most of it isn't peer-reviewed. Um, so actually, you have to do quite a lot of digging, and we've spoken to manufacturers, and we've spoken to individuals who are doing work within their field. Um, I work on a committee where we um, work with some anaesthetic innovators. Um, a lot of people are doing work in their sheds and are sticking things on patients. That's entirely up to them, but just remembering that any intervention is, is as real as giving people a drug. We can discuss the difference in safety. Um, I completely agree that sitting a patient in front of a TV screen, getting them watching a video game, has a different risk profile to giving the patient an, an untested drug. The Ethics Committee don't agree with that, though. We go through all the, exactly the same HRO procedures that, that anyone else would do. So there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of literature out there, but I would disagree that there's a lot of high quality science lit scientific literature. The next thing we do is build a programme theory, and that explains in precise terms exactly how we think the intervention is going to work. So what exactly do we think it's going to do? So, a video, a VR video on an Oculus Rift. Beautiful, we're going to distract the patients with it. Are we distracting the patients? What are we doing? Are we just um, closing off the ward environment from them? Are we giving them something nice to look at? Are we taking them on a meditative journey? What, are we, what is it exactly doing? There are some homemade um, goggle systems where you, where you can colour them in, particularly used by children. Fantastic, low cost, off the shelf that you put your phone in. Brilliant. The children colour it in and they take them in, into hospital with them. So what's that? Is it a toy? Is it entertainment? Is it something comforting? Is it distraction? Is it helping them understand where they are? It's, it's a bit boring and it makes all these, you know, fun technologies actually less exciting than taking them in and getting patients to play with them. But actually if you don't do that, you don't know how to make it better for next time. So we then plan our process, that involves us with all projects, nice Gantt chart, making sure you've got the right collaborators, making sure you've got PPI, so patient public involvement really early on, to make sure that you're again making something that doesn't just good, look, look good on the front of your hospital newsletter, or the BBC or whatever, because these get a lot of, um, a lot of interest from, from the media, especially once you start putting Oculus Rifts on, onto patients, everyone gets very excited about it. Um, but it's really important that you're building something that the patients actually want and need. Um, you need lots of money. You need permissions to do this. So before you start the process of designing, you need to think about where your permissions process is, is going to be going, because this whole thing will take you six months to six to 12 months. You also need to decide at what point of maturity your device is going to get to before you put it on patients, real patients, not pretend patients. So we, we, we have a, P, a PPI network that can test some of our component parts, but to put it on patients, and we do this on the intensive care unit, to put it on intensive care patients, you have to get HRA permission, and that includes MHRA permission. So you've got to decide at what stage you're going to jump in and start testing your 
your devices and that's a balance between getting something that's going to be actually use, useful and use, potentially usable and potentially might work between that and developing something for years and years and years that by the time you've actually perfected it, actually medicine's moved on and the intervention is no longer needed. It's important to consider the environment of your patient carefully. You have to think about the impact of the device, not only on the patient, but also on the working environment. So consider how it's going to affect the nurses, consider how it's going to affect delivering care to your patient. So how do these devices work? We did an extensive systematic review looking at um, devices that were used in healthcare settings, in acute healthcare settings. We were interested particularly in intensive care. Actually, there's only a couple of papers out there where they're using um, interactive systems within intensive care settings, um, and they are um, based out over in the States. So we widened our strategy and looked at all acute care settings. And then we tried to boil down from these papers exactly the th um, what the theory of what these um, interventions were doing and we broke these down and this is a sort of this is we've still we've modified this from um, Aradazi's model of care so we've looked at improving the effectiveness of treatment and care and this we've broken down into performance feedback which we've just talked about and exposing the patient to a therapeutic environment so actually can the VR um, interface provide therapy itself we also talked about modifying the experience patients and carers have. So can we deliver the same care but change how the patient experiences it? So again, as we've talked about, attention diversion, exclusion of the hospital environment, trying to mediate some of the stresses that hospitals give people, particularly within critical care, where most units are windowless or you get a nice, uh, QE is lovely, you get a nice view of the women's hospital if, if you're really, really lucky. Um, but most, save the Lane Fox unit here, which has a lovely view, um, most units, I think we probably agree, are not particularly um, emotionally or psychologically therapeutic. Also looking at improving patient self-efficacy, motivation, socialisation, a lot of that work's been done in the sort of um, uh, sports and fitness um, world as well. So actually we've, we've pulled on some of their um, learning points. So because this is a PhD I made a really complicated picture. Hopefully we'll distract my examiners for half an hour or so. So what we did was we thought carefully about what, what we wanted to do. We thought carefully about what care was within, uh, within our intensive care and we tried to work out how we could then develop useful, usable and effective um, treatments using interactive technology. So the centre circle is looking at all the different components of care within intensive care. So it's organ failure, skeletal muscle um, performance, pain control, nutrition, mental well-being, and respiratory muscle performance. You could just to say you could make 50 different diagrams of this. This is fairly arbitrary, but that's what we, as a as a research team, felt that we could break down ITU care into. We then talked about the etiology of, those, of all those different components. We then talked about some of the standard interventions that we use within our um, critical care, and our ITU is a level two, three unit. Then we talked about what we could use interactive technology for to modify some of those treatment strategies and some of the factors that are mediated by using VR. And within that, we built um, four different programs of work, uh, Revere Move, Revere Breathe, Revere Sleep, uh, and VREP burns and broke these down into two paradigms, mirrors, which is our performance feedback work, and windows, which is changing the patient's perspective of where they are. From that was born the, the REVERE programme, which is restorative virtual environments for re rehabilitation. Second most important thing to do in research, make up a catchy name after, after your picture. Um, and then we launched our first study. Now, the first intervention we started with was going to be virtual reality distraction for um, dressing changes by soldiers um, on our military ward. Um, I was lucky, unlucky, lucky enough to be um, heavily involved with some of the re uh, repatriation of some of our most seriously ill patients who were injured in um, Iraq and Afghanistan, then continued to look after them both on the intensive care and up on ward, up on ward 412, which is the military trauma unit. Anyone who was visiting the ward between sort of 2005, 2008, 9, when we were getting our most seriously injured back, 
would have heard patients crying behind curtains having their dressing changes done despite the fact we used multimodal analgesia, we used peripheral nerve block catheters, we did the absolute best we could in terms of polypharmacy, psychological support, yet they were still really struggling. So this is where the original funding came from. They were looking at alternative strategies and actually when we spoke to soldiers they were not keen on taking Entonox, having morphine, they were already hallucinating, really struggling psychologically, were really not enjoying the side effects from their um, analgesic regime. Yet they were spending weeks, weeks, months with us having reconstructive surgery. So we looked at the potential to use virtual reality distraction. We developed our first um, simulator, we took it through permissions and the war finished which was amazing. But then we had a device that we didn't have any patience for. So if anybody's wanting to start world change, I can totally recommend an expensive research project for doing so. So we look around the hospital and we're like, who else is in pain? So we wandered around. <laughs> and from the corners of the Burns unit, we found some patients. You'll notice this isn't a current, currently serving soldier, uh, but this is one of our RAF nurses. So we, we launched into the Burns unit with great enthusiasm. We'd already developed a trial protocol. We did a quick, a quick audit that showed that 75% of patients experienced moderate or severe pain during dressing changes that didn't need ketamine but were needing morphine. Uh, they all had sort of 10, 12 days length of stay, mean, perfect, off we went. Permissions granted and we started. Um, within that, we'd obviously considered the specification of user requirements and what we did is just cut across from soldiers. So we did lots of lovely work looking at what soldiers wanted, what sort of activity they wanted, um, what the environment was, well that was easy because the Burns unit, albeit without water, is basically the same as the uh, military trauma unit, same medical device team, um, similar nursing staff, actually there's a lot of military staff down on the Burns unit, so we thought, smashing, same intervention, similar length of dressing change. Uh, we decided we weren't going to be ambitious and use this during water-based dressing changes. Anybody who's seen Snow World that's used out in, in the States, they've got a waterproof, MRI-proof version, unfortunately military funding didn't extend to that. Quite, quite as well. But anyway, so we, used, we decided to use this for dry dressing changes. So this was virtual restorative environment therapy, our first um, system. This was a speedboat game where patients drove a speedboat um, around a course collecting life rings uh, and they scored points for the number of rings they caught. Uh, this was an interesting part of working with the team, the um, group of young men who were designing this from the U University of Birmingham. Fantastic, very talented, very enthusiastic, trying to get them stopped Trying to stop them putting explosions into it was pretty tricky. And actually, when we demoed this on the, on the military ward, that was bad enough. Um, <laughs> actually, balls of fire. It's very hard to build a game without balls of fire, apparently. So it was a learning point for both of us in being specific about what your, your requirements are. Because we knew what the patients were like. We knew that actually explosions of fire weren't ideal for soldiers and certainly weren't ideal for Burns patients. Um, but they didn't know that. So actually we, we learned a lot, that was one of our first um, learning points. Um, we built a model to explain how we thought it might work and off we went. Uh, so this trial was supposed to be run for three months, we should have recruited 25 patients, we did the audit, we predicted the patient throughput um, and you'll see from that we recruited seven patients and that, that was actually over a 14 month period when we eventually gave up and closed. Uh, why? Anyone done research with Burns patients before? Anyone work with Burns patients currently? Um, quite a large cohort of patients in the Birmingham Burns unit come from Birmingham prison. Um, they, throw, um, they throw sugary tea at each other, which then sticks and then burns. Now we actually had HRA permission to recruit Burns patients, um, so that wouldn't have been an issue, but actually trying to encourage them to come in and use a system that's distracting, we provided them with morphine analgesia not so enthusiastic. Um, trying to find patients who weren't too psychiatrically unwell to uh, recruit to a medical trial, difficult. Um, trying to recruit patients who were elderly frail and had been a long lie against a radiator and then were being palliated, they were crossed off. So actually, we screened hundreds of patients but very few were actually suitable. One of the main reasons for that was, for a ch was between us starting the inception of the trial and launching it, there was a complete paradigm shift in how these patients were, were being cared for. 
all but those who had to be in hospital for the reasons I've explained uh, were going home and having outpatient therapy and their political setting in the outpatient department wasn't that wasn't such that we were able to launch this in the unit. So this is a lesson learned that we spent a long time developing a scientifically nice study. We powered it properly, we came up, we thought very carefully about what our outcome measures were going to be, we thought very carefully about how we were going to measure pain, how we were going to, to deliver it. What we didn't think about was our context properly. But the nurses really liked it. And actually everybody thought we, um, we did really simple usability assessments and it came out really well. So we thought, well, let's, let's move on. So <laughs> this was virtual nature therapy. So now we've moved into intensive care. We thought we'd try and improve our psychological wellbeing and sleep of patients on the ITU. Um, some of our level two patients stay with us for weeks and weeks. So we looked at how we could improve their sleep. We'd done an audit which showed that um, patient self-reported sleep was pretty appalling. Um, so we thought maybe we could, if we provide them with uh, sun setting, nice relaxation, uh, virtual reality in a graded exposure. So the first night they just watched the sun going down. Second night they were able to explore using um, a thumb mouse that jumped them between different viewpoints and the third night they were fully interactive and they could walk down the um, coastal path. You'll notice we're not using headsets, patients who have tracheostomies and have profound limb weakness as our long stay, stay patients do are trapped if you put them into a um, head mouse display so it just went onto a screen. Again, anybody spot our slight problem with recruitment? So we recruited 30 patients to this study and we had 12 patients complete all our interventions. And again, this was due to the, our lack of realisation that the time between um, commencing the trial and finishing the trial, those five days, that the patient was fit enough to consent and take part in the study. And it had to be a Monday because of the logistics of the trial that we didn't have weekend cover. Most of those patients had gone by the time we were on the fifth night of the trial and, and had been discharged. So actually the window of opportunity was so narrow on our unit, particularly in a time when we're getting people out as quickly as we can to readmit other patients in, was too narrow. We think the system worked. Our, st our statistician will, will disagree. Our original um, statistical plan was to, to um, uh, to use a generalised estimating equation across all the um, across all the interventions. Basically, if you have too few in the last interventions, you're, the chance of you um, uh, getting a, uh, an accurate p-value very small. If you compare um, our control conditions versus our uh, virtual nature therapy exposure, you do get a, st a statistically significant difference, but the statistician says we can't do that. <laughs> the joys of stats. Um, we, in terms of our usability, we moved on from that, from using our simple two question um, that we'd use during uh, the burn study. And we use a system usability scale, which you'll see is highly published, um, is useful in this situation. And a score of, a, of above 70 um, is generally acceptable for new devices. So for a number of our patients they found, and our staff, they found the system usable. We then moved on to performance feedback. So we've then moved on to our, um, uh, we've talked about our Windows interventions. This is our Mirrors interventions. So we got some more funding despite our struggle to um, uh, recruit patients. Um, and this time we were looking at um, improving patient skeletal muscle performance and respiratory muscle performance on the intensive care. So patients who spend a long time on, on the ITU are prone to developing ICU acquired weakness and can then spend weeks, months, years rehabilitating from that. A lot of our patients obviously spend a long time um, mechanically ventilated, so our original plan had been to look at improving, speeding up the process of weaning from mechanical ventilation. The challenge we had with that was the risk of interfering with a ventilator and the cost and the MHRA approvals we'd need. So we switched to looking at improving um, respiratory performance in patients who had undergone major upper GI surgery, so it's me. Simpler intervention, doesn't need fiddling around with ventilator circuits, um, and actually we already had a spirometer which we could use. So in deciding the intervention we were going to look at, we built a matrix looking at whether we could recruit to a trial, learning point from previously, how much it was going to cost to do it, and the practicalities of, of designing the system. And the first system we built was the Velo VR, 
which was a system that works with the motor member recumbent cycle, which we use for patients on the ITU who are awake, cooperative, um, and are suffering from ICU-acquired weakness. We built two simulations. The first one was providing the patient with distraction. So it tracked their pedals, and they just saw themselves pedaling down the um, South Devon coastal path. The following session, we'd recorded the previous session, and they competed against an avatar of their previous session. Does that make sense? So they competed against the ghost, and the ghost was, was, was them last time. And then the final session was them using this without any um, VR at all. And then we used a within subject uh, model to look at whether they'd improved the amount of time they'd spent pedaling and the distance they, they spent pedaling on the Motormed. We had, again, six patients complete the protocol. This time we didn't make any claims as to how many we were going to recruit. We only had six months to, to finish this trial. Uh, we, sh we got an improvement across sessions. Now, we're not going to claim that this was due to our system because it may well just have been a training effect. This was a feasibility study to see whether actually the system was usable and potentially useful. Um, we'd need to do a proper between patient um, larger randomized control trial to see whether it's actually better than standard Motomed. I'm not going to talk about it because we don't have time, but we did a lot of work looking at patient engagement, self-efficacy, etc. And we found that patients' um, motivation was better using the Velo VR, their um, understanding of what they were supposed to be doing, and their um, experience, breathlessness, and anxiety were also reduced. Our final device was the Inspire VR, which was an um, electronic incentive spirometer. So we use um, spirables normally, just the plastic incentive spirometers following its ophthalmies. In this trial, the patients had to use it for three days following the, their esophagectomy. They alternated between the spara ball and this device. They took deep breaths in, and the trebuchet catapulted rocks off out to sea. Again, design issues were we didn't want this to be some sort of murdering device, so it had to be, we had to be very clear that these were empty boats. There were no lives being, being lost. And again, we tried to make it as interesting as possible but reduce the drama in a setting where people are potentially anxious and kept it as simple as possible. A lot of our patients are quite um, elderly and vulnerable. Uh, we, we, we didn't really know how to um, design the game. We obviously wanted the patients to improve with each breath. So we came up with a pragmatic um, design where we anticipated that patients would drop their um, inspiratory capacity and then increase it over the following days. And the game was built to encourage that to happen. Uh, we recruited successfully to this trial. We had um, 25 patients complete this study. We showed that the, the success of this study was measured by the amount of time patients were able to use this device and the success with which they used the device compared to a, a standard spirable. What we found was that the Inspire VR, our new system, was not available as much as the spirable was. <laughs> when it was available, it was used just as effectively. So what we were able to do was capture data on patients' inspiratory capacity, performance, etc. The problem with this device was that it was we had reliability issues throughout the study, and that was due to the um, complexity of interfacing a commercial off-the-shelf spirometer with a new game. So we learned from that that actually beta testing is really important, early testing is really important, uh, well subject testing is really, really important, and that's what I was talking about before with jumping in and starting your clinical trial before, before a system is actually mature enough to be able to be used. Uh, Something that's interesting to note for future studies is that we got the patients to record how often they'd used it. It then recorded itself how often it had been used. And there was a massive difference between patient reported use and actually recorded use. Whether the device was recording accurately or not, we're not sure. I suspect it's more likely to, to be due to patient um, adherence with recording protocols. So that's worth knowing for the future. Uh, and this is what happens to patients' in inspective, um, uh, maximum inspiratory capacity post-op. There's no pattern there. We thought that they would track up nicely, and actually they're all, over, they're all over the place. So the next iteration will redesign the um, software algorithm, not anticipating the patient's going to necessarily increase their insp inspiratory capacity. But again, usability scores weren't bad. One person was not enthusiastic about it. Um, but... <laughs> But within the complex setting that's intensive care, these are, they started off le level three um, and were level two all by day two. Um, the nurses accepted it really nicely, the patients accepted it, um, and they're more than happy for us to continue um, working on this, on this project. 
Um, and just to show that we do use our SIM suite, uh, this is our medical device testing centre, um, and this is our next project that I can't talk about too much, um, but this is us weaning SIM man. <laughs> Uh, obviously, I work with a really large team um, from the university, um, military, academic, and critical care um, at the QE, um, and they've all been fantastically supportive, as, as have our patients. Thank you.